Welcome to the final episode of 2023. I'm Susan Wood and this is episode 32 of Have the Nerve. We've spoken about access to large-scale events such as music festivals, concerts. I may have mentioned something about the weird inclusion issue in running events. But what about smaller-scale events? What if you want to attend a local play? Or, hang on, what if you are a playwright with a disability and you want to stage a production? Or, what if you are a stage actor with a disability and you want to perform? Do you get a fair chance? So my name is Jacqueline Twilley. My pronouns are she, her. And I guess I would describe myself as a queer, disabled, emerging playwright. I've made some films, some short films, uh, trying to make theatre, or at least one particular (laughs) theatre, more accessible to artists and uh, creatives and audiences. Jacqueline is the former accessibility manager for Darlinghurst Theatre Company in Sydney and currently lives in the UK studying at Goldsmiths College at the University of London. We talk about everything from basic access for someone viewing a play to access on stage to her thoughts about how the LGBTQI plus community perceive people with disabilities and disability itself. We cover a lot, so strap in. Why does access mean so much to you, especially in the arts? Yeah, wow, okay, that... I mean, that is a huge, huge question. We're starting with a huge question. We're solving the world's ills. Um, I mean, it's obviously, you know, a selfish reason for myself, first and foremost, but then secondarily for um, the broader community. Because I wasn't always the accessibility manager for Darlo. I was just there as an administrator and kind of... um, but still really struggling with like my own health and access needs and mobility and um, always kind of trying to push that to the front. And then that a small thing called pandemic happened, just a blip that happened and, and no consequences for our community at all. I ended up going back to regional Victoria, moving back in with my parents for a year And the whole theatre shut down. But it was kind of good because I got to sort of focus on my own health and my own body and what I needed and to, like, move through the world and everything. So then when I came back to Darlow, I kind of had that fire lit and they really noticed that and then they approached me and said, hey, what, what would that look like if you kind of made a role out of this? Like, do other... Com- other theatre companies have an access manager type role. Can you go and research this, find out about this? And I, I went, sure, yeah, great. And long story short, no no theatre companies that I could find anyway in Sydney. Um, and maybe, I could be wrong, but maybe Australia-wide have a, like a dedicated accessibility manager. Um, I know Sydney Fringe have an accessibility coordinator, I know the Opera House have an access coordinator, but um, that's that's pretty much it. Like, no, nowhere else had it. So that was outrageous to me. Um, and I thought, well, if I'm working here, I want my needs to be met, but I also want to make sure we're including audiences appropriately. And as a, as a playwright, I want to make sure that our artists are being included and our creatives are being included um so yeah that's that's kind of a (laughs) long-winded answer to your question you mentioned um people with disability who are playwrights people with disability who are actors and part of the performance arts community do you want to talk about what disability and the arts well at least in performing arts and um writing what that currently looks like yeah um it's it's really interesting because that it seems to be uh, I think there's still quite a quite a bit of fear around non-disabled creatives including disabled artists in their in their productions. I think there's a bit of or quite a bit of apprehension around oh is it is it going to be too difficult? What is this going to look like? And so then we that's when like nothing 
nothing happens and those people don't get included. Um, but I also think there's a really, really big push from, particularly from d- disabled and, and neurodiverse actors and performers specifically, a push to see accurate representation in the casting process, which I think is really, really important. Um, I, I I don't know if you've heard or if this is mostly in the sort of performing like circles or if you've heard of the phrase cripping up yes so the term cripping up has um been used in used by actors and performers when a non-disabled actor plays disability so they they play the role of a disabled person in and usually in a way that's like pretty uncomfortable i would say to watch um and and I know there's this artic- this argument from non-disabled actors saying, oh, but, you know, I'm an actor and it's you're trying to fill the shoes of, you know, somebody who's different to you and you're trying to, you know, really just play anybody. Anybody can play any part. But I think it... I feel like it's it, it feels very different when it's you're performing somebody's disability. Um, I think... You know, a classic example that comes to mind is um, Jake Gyllenhaal in that movie Stronger, where I don't know if you've seen that season. No, I he, haven't. He plays he plays a um, a marathon runner, and it's based on a true story, and they they always are. Um, you can't get the inspiration unless it's based on a true story. A true story. <laughs> well. And that's this movie as well. It just it just reeks of inspiration. So he plays this um, this Boston Marathon runner, and a few years ago there was a mm, the, the bombings. There was a bombing, yeah, at the finish line, and he plays this man who uh, got caught in that, and he lost both of his legs as a result. And so Jake Gyllenhaal plays that man, and um, it fo- follows the period of his life where he's like going through all of that and he believes that he's totally unlovable now and why would his his girlfriend stay with him and you know and then she and this is spoilers by the way total spoilers coming up um and she find you know she she then finds out she's pregnant and he's you know can't possibly believe that he could be any type of worthwhile father and she should just leave him anyway the whole like pity party thing but then, you know, he, he, like, becomes this big inspiration to the city of Boston and, like, they – Boston, the city, manages to heal from this terrible event because he manages to overcome his disability. Like, it's like <laughs> – <laughs> It's just the whole inspiration porn, like and, – and they, you know, they must have done it through, like, green screen and all of this stuff to, like, show him as his character first with, like, no legs and then he's, like, got his prosthetic. But this, like, performability of some somebody who like just these different stages of of disability and that's the perfect example of the term cripping up do you think that they choose these okay now I was just thinking about and I haven't seen any of them me before you or whatever it is and um yeah classic and I have spoken to somebody before who on this podcast who absolutely hates that movie but it's it's uh it's always a former life walker to then becoming mm. a wheelchair user or whatever it is. Um, do you think they choose the actors in that situation because they can play both as the walker and the after? I guess what I'm asking here is... No, I don't know what I'm asking. No, because then what about um, the Daniel Day-Lewis one, My Left Foot? But then that's the whole thing of like, oh, he's a method actor and like I've read loads of articles about because that one really as well like I also just don't really like that film um and which is controversial among film people um because you know it's so good he's such a good performer and that's the thing it's because he performed disability so well he was so believable as somebody with CP that he won all these awards like that's what he won the awards for was his performance of disability i read all these articles about how even in between takes he would stay in character like in this performance of of 
the character's disabledness and it's like it's just almost like it's like a costume right like disability is this costume that you can put on so when you're talking about it in terms of like the performing arts or even acting or any sort of acting um are you saying that there's just more of a want to hire people who are able-bodied because they can easily slip in and out of those roles what do you think yeah i i think it's a few things i think i think like certainly like you mentioned before if they are doing that kind of inspirational you know somebody overcoming something they've had this traumatic event happen they like to show the you know before and after um but i also think it it comes down to just like uh, and probably as well a bit of like oh this person's famous this non-disabled actor's famous so they'll bring in the big bucks and also a bit of you know um good old ableism and fear and oh we just don't know how we would work with this person how how can we make sure that we're meeting their access requirements just feels a bit difficult it's easier if we just use this non-disabled person because we know they can just easily get onto set and like jump in and out when we need them we don't have to worry about their fatigue levels or their pain levels or you know our doorways wide enough do we have places for them to sit down do we you know oh yeah we can do a 16 hour day that's easy we don't have to worry about things like that you know whereas when you're working with a disabled actor you do have to take all of those things into consideration I think the other side of it is not even just in the casting of actually disabled characters with disabled actors. I think it's also just there needs to be a shift in the casting of any characters with disabled actors. So there needs to be this sort of shift, and I think it's happening slowly, but this shift of of perception of of what roles look like. Because I was just thinking back to all the times that I've ever seen, like, plays, if I've ever seen a musical, if I've ever seen anything that was mainstream, um, that wasn't a disability arts festival. Because, yeah, you're right, it would they would probably be thinking a lot about uh, commitment to time. and But that's why you have backup people, right? Especially when you have in-person performances. Yeah, in theatre for sure. But I also think it, like, and more so in film, but theatre to an extent as well, the way that historically, like, we've timed things, you know, people can't and shouldn't be working, disabled or not, for hugely long hours in the day, you know? Everyone benefits if you have appropriate work hours and appropriate rest times and all of that. Oh, sorry, there's like, can you hear in the background some motor going off? I'm going to close a window because somebody's like cut, trimming a hedge or something outside. Hold on. Oh, my God. I think you can tell the professionalism of this podcast. So if we just structure a date properly where people worked proper hours, it would really benefit everyone. But Jacqueline, how does... Like, especially in theatre, in the performing arts, how do performances, to include people with disabilities, how are they usually funded? To answer your question, I'm kind of going to circle back a little bit to talk about the idea of disabled arts festivals. Because I think councils and, and city and, you know, government funding, I think they, they love to fund disabled arts festivals and things like that, generally. Um and, and this is not me saying that every disabled arts festival gets funding. That's that's not it at all. But I think that it's definitely very appealing um, to a funding body for a disabled arts festival to get funding. Um, the problem with that is, and you and I have discussed this, is that the only people who go to those festivals are other disabled people. <laughs> like, not the people who probably should be going to, you know, go and, and check their ableism and, and, you know, it becomes very insular, those festivals. And, you know, and I think there's definitely a place for them and they're important um, for creating safe spaces and all of that. But on a broader scale, how do we get projects funded that include, just organically include people with disability? That That is a great question. <laughs> I ask that because... 
again, just thinking about performance art. Yeah. And I said it in another podcast. I've said it in a couple of podcasts now just to see what the answers are. I had um, Mm. a lady in a previous episode say that it's good when you're talking about peer support, like when you have your peers supporting you as somebody who is, you know, I don't know, whether it's an artist or whoever it is um, doing some performance or uh, an event where you just want to support your tribe, right? Um, But as you say, how are they going to know that, those disabled artists exist if they're not integrated into performances that are for like that are aren't disability specific events you're going to put on a play you haven't included somebody with a disability um which then gets back around to the conversation we keep having about having over and over audiences don't know uh Jacqueline and I have been friends for quite a while now and we've had this discussion like over and over and over again it's almost like there's a society disconnect between the person with the disability being their own act like being an actor in their own right being an artist in their own right and the disability itself and how to and I hate saying it integrate them into a cast <laughs> thoughts <laughs> yeah no you're you're completely right because there's this thing of like and to use the analogy again of you know well, oh why can't this character who's just written as the doctor be played by somebody with a disability because then the audience is like oh oh, but what happened to them? Oh, they're not referencing it in the story. And the audience gets so hung up on why aren't we finding out why that character only has one arm and it's because it's not relevant to the story. They're just playing the doctor (laughs) Mm. as written. Um, But I think a really really great example of this is, uh, I don't know if you know the Broadway performer Ali Stroker, no. So she she actually won a Tony Award a couple of years ago for and she was the first the f- and I I could be wrong but I'm almost certain she was the first wheelchair user to ever win a Tony Award as a performer. And she won it she won it for best supporting actress in a musical for the production of Oklahoma. And she wore this fabulous yellow dress. I remember that. And the role in that musical is super physical, tons of dancing, is, you know, not, not at all a disabled character. And obviously her disability is not referenced in the show at all. She's just there in all of her glory, singing her guts out. And... Uh, and I read an interview with her and she said that part of her audition process is always having to show them her own, like, this is how I would adapt the choreography. This is how you can, this is how I can work with you to adapt whatever movement we're doing in the show, because part of her audition isn't just convincing the directors and the producers that yes, I'm, I'm the best actress. Yes. I'm the best singer for this job, but also that, by hiring me it's not going to make your lives more difficult but it is going to make your show more interesting like good and bad to hear <laughs> like like do you know you, you know what, i mean you know what i mean it's it's unfortunate that ali would have to continually talk about how she would make it work for them a lot of theater companies and You know, I'm just speaking from theatre companies, but um, this would probably be the case for most performing arts industries, is that for the longest time, I think the feeling was that, oh, well, disabled people go and they watch art, they go and consume art, they don't perform in it, they don't partake in it. Why? Like, okay, we've got now, we've, you know, we've adapted, we've got accessible seating, we've got wheelchair spaces, we've got all of this, we've got... You know, okay, now we've started to include some audio described performances, we've got some Auslan interpretive performances, but 
oh, but backstage is still inaccessible, but we don't we don't have any disabled performers. So it was still while the the audience side was changing, the back of house side and the the rehearsal side and all of the other side of the curtain, so to speak, wasn't changing. And so now, even though that is shifting and we are seeing more disabled performers, the theatres themselves, because a lot of them are in these historic buildings and they're all hiding behind slash protected by, in air quotes, um, heritage listed statuses, there's no, or there's an excuse for them to not make the necessary changes in order to be accessible backstage so they can have performers with limited mobility and you know include performers that way um so it's kind of it's on both sides of the curtain it's not you can't just be accessible for your audiences but not for your artists and vice versa you and i had a brief discussion before we recorded this about headshots and um what exactly is the and and it's 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 the same as a job interview because it is a job interview really if you think about it how much of your or even a dating website how much of your disability do you reveal to that person um you know and i think you and i were talking about how you have a headshot and it is literally your head (laughs) And then you look at somebody with a disability and somehow, for some reason, their entire body, including, like, the equipment they use, is included in this headshot. Why? Well, we know why. Um. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I, like, I am kind of, and again, I know exactly, like, I totally agree with you why, you know, and in that, again, for want of a better word, you don't want to be in a situation where you turn up for a job and or for an audition and the the directors or whoever are yeah surprised and they go oh well we didn't know that the play that you know you were coming we we have stairs you can't get in um that type of thing but I'm very much of the opinion that even you know to say what actors should just send in a headshot not a full body shot and and again, I, I know I'm coming from a place, from a, a theatre where we are actively, like, asking people when they come to auditions and job interviews, like, do you have any access needs? Like, what, what does that look like? How can we make this a space for you? And that every experience is not that safe and not like that. But, yeah, I kind of feel like if you're, if the job description or the casting notice says, you know, we're looking for a, a middle-aged woman with, I don't know, short blonde hair and, you know, I don't know, big brown eyes. And, oh, yep, I've got short blonde hair and big brown eyes, but I, you know, I'm missing a leg. Who cares? Like, <laughs> like you should send in a headshot. Like, I, I would then, like, say what my access needs were. I'd be like, look, hey, by the way, I without necessarily disclosing if I didn't feel comfortable but I don't know I treat it the same as dating where it's like I'll tell you more once I get to know you but I'm not going to give you my whole life story Jacqueline another thing that you and I have talked about um at length which we're going to talk about on this podcast do you feel like inclusion is being brought on in stages so when we talk about inclusion we talk about it's more than disability. We talk about race. We talk about uh, gender, non-gender, um, non-binary actors, um, all of that, and inclu- including people with disabilities. I guess I've noticed that there's been a shift, but there has been a shift in stages. And it seems like disability is almost that one that is the last. There's been such... A, like such amazing and such forceful movements happening, you know, with the Black Lives movement and, um, you know, with like the LGBTQIA plus movements, like there've been such really, really positive steps towards literally <laughs> making the world a better place. Um, 
but yeah, I do, I do feel like when it comes to the disabled community, it's still kind of, I guess, for want of a better phrase, it kind of feels like the last frontier, <laughs> like, which seems ridiculous because everyone from every other community, like it's so intersectional and you can, you can become disabled at any moment. Yeah. Just because of those intersectionalities, it surprises me that it's not happened sooner or it's not been a part of these other movements yeah and i and i i don't know again if it's because of the oh it's it's too difficult it's too it costs too much money i saw a a tiktok <laughs> i saw a tiktok the other day and i wish i could remember who the creator was but it was it was great and it was basically about how um being black is not a monolith when the black lives matter movement started it was kind of very just like black lives matter and then we had to start getting into like oh no like as as a white person i had to start really delving into like this goes deeper than just saying black lives matter you know i had to start unpacking all of that on my own um but i feel like with the disabled community it's already so obviously not a monolith like it's so does that make sense like it's Jacqueline, we're inspirations. I don't know. Right. I think this is where people get caught up is because they can't just go, oh, yeah, we're going to like we're going to be super accessible. Here's a ramp. It's like, OK, that's great. But that only makes it accessible for like part of the community. Or they go, yeah, we're going to be accessible. We've got inter we've got Auslan interpreters. It's like, OK, great. Again, but that's again, that, that's only useful for a, a part of the community. Like it's not it's it's quite complex. And I think people just go, oh, I just don't know. Oh, it's just so difficult. And it's just so much effort. And it's like, oh. And now we're going to have to change our whole, cre like, from an arts perspective, we're going to change our whole creative vision, which is an experience I've had, by the way. Definitely can't name names or shows because I'll get in trouble. But, um, yeah, we had, a, we had a show which um, we, from the very beginning... I, from like before rehearsals even began, I had said to the creative team and the director and everyone, we've got, these are all the access performances, including, and this, this one that this story particularly relates to is the Auslan interpreter performance. It's happening on this date. This is where the Auslan interpreters will be standing. So we'll need to make sure you include a spotlight in your lighting rig, all of that. Yep, 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 all good, great, okay. And I kept checking in and reminding them, you know, hey, just remember, you've got an Auslan performance. The day of the performance, I went to the theatre to meet the Auslan interpreters, and when I got there, I saw where they had, like, put the light. And it, actually, no, the light was fine, but the stage manager was like, well, they can't stand there. And I went, well, well that's where they've all that's where they need to stand we have a, like a whole group from the deaf community coming to see this show this is where the, the Auslan interpreters need to stand and she was like no well they can't stand there because they're going to block the set I was like well they're not they're not blocking the set for a start they were positioned specifically in in front of a part of the set where it was like off the ground and you know the part that happened behind them happened for about five seconds and was not critical to the story anyway I ended up having this huge argument with this stage manager because she was just like no it's going to ruin the whole creative vision it's, it's going to ruin the whole creative vision she had been on the phone to the director who had a total meltdown about it because it was going to ruin the vision and could we move all the all the deaf patrons to a different part of the auditorium and could we move the Auslan interpreters over way off the stage to the side yeah off the stage but they're not going to be able to see the performance yeah. if they're okay never mind if, if you're playing like watching tennis like with your head watching a tennis match anyway it was it was a nightmare it was an absolute nightmare and I ended up so I said so what you're doing right now is for one performance you're putting the director's creative vision above the access and inclusion and equity of 
paying customers when you've known that this was a thing that was going to happen in this location since day one and I was the I was the bad guy for like standing my ground anyway they ended up standing exactly where I wanted them to um but it was a whole thing and this is yeah I need to clarify this is not from the theatre let's swing back to changing the mindsets of directors and producers and I guess stage managers when it comes to access and inclusion because um, that's an excellent example of one night readjusting for an audience it's almost like you just would prefer they weren't there at all yeah that's that's what it felt like and and like oh do we have to do we have to do this Ugh, can't they just do it oh really what kind of things do we need to start with um well we i say the royal we what kind of things do producers directors stage managers what do you think they should think about first when that when we've talked about you know just making it accessible for actors to even be able to audition to your plays at all i think they need to become aware of how much money the disabled community has to spend on the arts. Um, there was a report that came out from America and uh, it was a couple of years old now, but in this report they said that globally, and I wish I could remember the name of the report, I'm really good at reading all this stuff and then not remembering any of the names of them, but in this report they uh, said that globally, on average, the disabled community, and in that term, the disabled community, they include not only the disabled people, but also um, family members, partners, carers, all of that, um, has a disposable income of around one trillion US dollars. I mean, it sucks that we need to put things down into dollar terms. It, exactly. But when you convert that to box office figures and people who are potentially buying tickets to your show, that is a huge market that's being underserved if we're talking just about audiences. So that's like a really harsh black and white figure that kind of speaks to producers and and the people who kind of make big executive decisions. And then we're maybe even going to see themselves actually just by chance represented on your stage. Like, what? <laughs> even as somebody with a disability, I am always, like, during the pandemic, I was always very fascinated by the Auslan interpreters um, with those daily updates from the New South Wales government about how many... Um, how many cases we had, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I went ahead and I was like, I want to learn what some of those things are. I'm not going to be able to learn full sentences. I found hmm. a Instagram called Auslan with David. Oh yeah. I follow it's him. It's great. Yeah. It's, I mean, even the basic, the basic words, how, how they do it like in front turn to the side, turn to the other side, and then put it into a sentence form. Amazing. Watching the Auslan interpreters of the New South Wales government update, I saw comment after comment from people going, that is the best thing I've ever seen. Watching them is the best thing I've ever seen. I don't know how to interpret Auslan, but I am so fascinated watching them. I saw an Auslan interpreter um, translate a Cardi B concert. <laughs> It was wild. Um, watching her translate what oh uh, was amazing. And I just think about how that is just one person on the stage within the eyesight of the performer. Just because they're hard of hearing or deaf doesn't mean they don't want to go and enjoy a concert. Um... 
it was just one thing that they added that they were like, you know what? We welcome you to come to our concert, welcome you to watch our performance, um, instead of just going, well, we, we're not here for you. Yeah. And that's, that's a big thing, I think, is saying that you are welcome. There are so many really amazing, wonderful, queer, disabled voices in the arts. I mean, the first that comes to my mind is Dan Dorr, and that is because I saw his show the other night at the Seymour Centre, um, and it was just so magnificent and so beautiful in terms of the access. And, and Dan Dorr um, is an Australian dancer and choreographer and performance maker who's actually based in the UK now and um, he uh, made this dance show, it's called the Dandor Show and it was basically it's like this kind of really uh, I don't want to misrepresent it but it's this very sort of like uh, sexual um, kind of exploration um, of himself um, and crip, he said it's, it's all about crip joy and it's him presenting himself um, as he wants to be seen to the audience and he has this big disclaimer at the top where he's saying um, I, I, I need you to know that all of this that you're about to see is is my doing, is my creation and um, is how I want you to see me and it's pretty intense, um, but the access at this show was second to none, um, which just speaks to art, queer art that is being disabled-led. Um, if you needed, if you wanted to or needed to have a longer period of time to enter the auditorium or to enter before everyone else, you could do so before they opened the doors. They had a trigger menu um, of all the triggers and you could talk, there was someone there you could talk to and they would explain exactly what all of the triggers were. Um, it was all, yeah, yeah. So there was one trigger that was choking and then the person would explain exactly what was going to happen and when um, they had like just every every sort of bit of information you could possibly need or want um they also had it was all uh captioned um and uh i mean it was a dance show it wasn't auslan interpreted but it was a predominantly a dance show <laughs> um but he also had this um at the top of the show he did sort of a, a whole access introduction saying you know you can come and go as you need if you if you need to just leave that's fine um when you see this symbol and this symbol came up on the screen um he said once you see that symbol in five seconds the music and the lights will get at their brightest and loudest that they will for the whole show and then he showed what that would sound and look like so people knew um yeah, it was just for, like just so phenomenal, and I think if you if you were non disabled, I think it would have been a really foreign experience. Probably very distracting. In uh, a way, yeah, maybe. maybe I hadn't thought of that actually. Yeah, I just thought, wow, this is so contrasted to what most of the sort of artistic and just not even artistic just most of the offerings are in Mardi Gras and Pride season um you know I think most of the events are held in spaces that aren't accessible to the members of the community that are disabled or um you know chronically ill it's it's like definitely a, an issue <laughs> the lack of accessibility um within the queer community for sure let's talk about the image of disability and how people are not, um, if you don't see somebody with a disability, it's almost like you're not, you're not even acknowledged. You're, you're not, you're not acknowledging that, that person's body. You talked, but when we were getting ready for this recording, you talked about disabled bodies not fitting the narrative. Do you want to talk a little bit more yeah. about that? 
Yeah, I think certainly within the queer community, I think when you think of Mardi Gras, the images that you are traditionally, like, shown are all of, like, very physically fit, very buff sort of male physiques in, like, little Speedos, and they're all very, like, physically very sort of fit I guess that narrative of of peak physical perfection so to speak um and many disabled bodies don't fit that um and and we know like within the queer community misogyny is like a big thing fat phobia is a huge thing like which is I I hope but I feel like this it's starting to change but I think there's still that that very like pressure to have this perfect physique because that's what is portrayed as the ideal or that's what the imagery is you know you know I mean and, and again it is changing but you look at like some of the earlier seasons I think of like RuPaul it's like very a lot of very perfect figures and like things like that whereas people with disability are often seen as like very non-sexual and very like like you said invisible so how do you how do you mesh those two identities of being somebody who's disabled and somebody who's queer? Like often those I think get quite separated out. Do you feel like there are people who are representatives of both um, sides of that community who feel like it's almost um, uh, it's a lot of pressure to then be the voice of every everybody yeah yeah because it's like you want to be desirable and you want to be like yeah I'm like living in my like queer sexiness or whatever but also I have you know like you know you look at the just the social calendar for Mardi Gras and for Pride there's 10 things on every single night and like if you have like any any sort of fatigue issue the idea that you can't go to every single thing you're not going there Jacqueline okay <laughs> you'll go <laughs> no. to one thing <laughs> but it's that whole thing like even the fear of missing out because the whole thing is like it's pride season and you've got to be everywhere and it's like where are we oh no I can't I'm at this thing or I'm at this thing and for dis- you know the disabled community that's so unrealistic we we can't just go to 4,000 events in one week like that's impossible we actually haven't talked about your disability at all for the whole podcast (laughs) (laughs) it's been a a while (laughs) you have ellis danlos syndrome i do yeah Um, um and so you know it comes with a whole range of things yeah I guess for anyone who is listening and doesn't know what Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is, it's a connective tissue disorder. Um, it uh, Connective tissue is in all your, your whole body. It makes up everything, all your joints, all your ligaments, blood vessels, everything. Um, so it causes joints to sublux and, and dislocate. Um, and you, a lot of people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome also have um, a thing called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome or POTS which I also have um, which basically just means that you like in a nutshell are susceptible to um, fainting and lightheadedness and um, fatigue so um, and I guess with with EDS uh, a lot of it um, is like joint pain and you know just a lot of a lot of joint pain and fatigue just like trying to keep all your joints in place and (laughs) upright and everything. You mentioned something when we were talking about this podcast about how your opinion, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, my memory is is lacking, maybe. Um, You mentioned to me that, like, you you think that the reason why uh, some of this intersectionality um, keeps being, you know, pushed to the side is because the history of queer arts was inaccessible by nature. Do you want to talk about that a bit more? Like I've tried to do some like really thorough research on this and it, and it is, it does kind of come up lacking a little bit, but my feeling is that because the, the history and the nature of, of the, 
where all of these sort of queer spaces originated from were from a necessity to, I guess, kind of go underground in a way. You know, these spaces were com- were popping up at a time where it wasn't by any means safe to be queer and was, you know, often illegal. Um, and, and I know it still is illegal in many places, but... Um, so a lot of these places were, you know, in these underground bars and, and underground small pokey places that are totally inaccessible. Um, and then if we combine that with looking at disability history and the way that dis- disabled people were included in the community back when this sort of queer... Um, when queer art and queer spaces were kind of starting to be a thing, like the the meshing of those were just, from what I can see, non-existent. You know, you had a lot of queer people, yeah, going into these underground spaces, making their art, expressing themselves in safe but hidden away spaces, um, away from the heteronormative society. And then you had a lot of disabled people who, through the social model of disability, couldn't even access society because public transport wasn't accessible at all cars if they were around like if people did have enough money to have a car they weren't accessible or people we know were like put into institutions and things like that so they weren't accessing or even exploring their sexual identity in the way that people are today that's where I think this the root of queer spaces particularly the spaces that are still operating today being inaccessible I think that's where it comes from um and you know you look at um a lot of the historical the really famous historical um queer spaces and I think you know in trying to preserve their um their history oftentimes they are reluctant to change or to become more welcoming I guess for one of a better phrase um I read an article just before I I started on here with you um and uh it was from London and there's um this pub called the Admiral Duncan and it's quite a historic queer bar in Soho in London and the reason for that is that there was this terrorist attack that happened there um that was like a a hate crime um uh, but it's still this very um like well-known gay bar and uh this visibly disabled man and his friend who was also visibly disabled they were meeting other friends there who were not disabled and they were um told by the bouncer when they turned up there they were like sorry it's we're closed for a private event there's you know unless you're a part of the private event you can't come in so they were like oh okay we'll go somewhere else they went somewhere else called their friends and their friends said oh no we're in here so they'd been turned away from this space that should have been theirs as as gay men they should have been allowed to go and like express themselves and and sort of you know be their their truest self in this safe space for for queer people um but they were turned away because they didn't fit the image because they were visibly disabled. So, so I think that, yeah, that all kind of ties in with the, the inaccessible, inaccessible nature of, of a lot of these queer spaces. Well, I mean, and also at the time people with disabilities were not proudly disabled i think that's what jordan Steele john said when i interviewed him you need to find people who are proudly disabled and it wasn't something that people were proud of even now yeah i think i think it's i think it's changing but i think it is slow i don't think it's changing fast enough um and i think you you've hit the nail on the head with the 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 element of pride um because i think even sort of the generation before us maybe not the generation just before us but certainly the one before that I think there was a a real shame around being disabled um 
and the sort of idea of like whatever you know oh no like we have to at whatever cost like we can't either acknowledge it or like it's this real big like um like uh kind of black mark or like a real big yeah real big shame um whereas i think our generation and and certainly the ones coming up behind us are all really proud when you and i were talking about um you were in two minds about going to London because it was like you wanted to try and do as much as you could for our community here rather than going to learn the thing that you definitely loved and dreamed about doing where you wanted to do it. Yeah, I was I was in two minds about going to London or not going to London. Um, I, you know, I lived there for a couple of years Oh, must be close to 10 years ago now. Um, and there's just like, no, I just thought there's no place like this. And, um, and it's always been my dream to like try and be a writer and, and, um, write for theater and write for film. And, um, but I've been doing all of this work in the community Sydney and I felt so conflicted and and without sounding like a total tosspot like stay and like fulfill this like sense of duty that I have to like try to make the world a better place for the community or do I go and like try to fulfill this like personal dream of mine and it was it was really tough um to land on because it's like oh it's just me like what about the whole community like wouldn't wouldn't I be better wouldn't my time be better served doing maybe something that's not you know not as creative and like not as creatively fulfilling but is better for more people you know you kind of had some harsh words to me and a few other people had some harsh words to me <laughs> um and, and wow. we're kind of wow. no, which were, which were... me what <laughs> um and and my mentor I have I have to say I'm such a bizarre friend like <laughs> I will it, will it will be like this passionate yelling <laughs> <laughs> no it was needed because I I was about to fall into my most hated trope, which was that of a martyr. And I hate that more than anything. Welcome to the final episode of 2023. I'm Susan Wood, and this is episode 32 of Have the Nerve. We've spoken about access to large-scale events such as music festivals, concerts. I may have mentioned something about the weird inclusion issue in running events. But what about smaller-scale events? What if you want to attend a local play? Or, hang on, what if you are a playwright with a disability and you want to stage a production? Or, what if you are a stage actor with a disability and you want to perform? Do you get a fair chance? So my name is Jacqueline Tooley. My pronouns are she, her. And I guess I would describe myself as a queer, disabled, emerging playwright. I've made some films, some short films, uh, trying to make theatre, or at least one particular theatre, <laughs> more accessible to artists and uh, creatives and audiences. Jacqueline is the former accessibility manager for Darlinghurst Theatre Company in Sydney and currently lives in the UK studying at Goldsmiths College at the University of London. We talk about everything from basic access for someone viewing a play to access on stage to her thoughts about how the LGBTQI plus community perceive people with disabilities and disability itself. We cover a lot, so strap in. Why does access mean so much to you, especially in the arts? Yeah, wow, okay, that... I mean, that is a huge, huge question. We're starting with a huge question. We're solving the world's ills. Um, I mean, it's obviously, you know, a selfish reason for myself, first and foremost, but then secondarily for um, 
the broader community because I wasn't always the accessibility manager for Darlo. I was just there as an administrator and kind of, um, but still really struggling with like my own health and access needs and mobility and um, always kind of trying to push that to the front. And then that a small thing called pandemic happened just a blip that happened and and no consequences for our community at all I ended up going back to regional Victoria moving back in with my parents for a year and the whole theatre shut down but it was kind of good because I got to sort of focus on my own health and my own body and what I needed and to like move through the world and everything so then when I came back to Darlow I kind of had that fire lit and they really noticed that and then they approached me and said hey what what would that look like if you kind of made a role out of this like do other com- other theater companies have an access manager type role can you go and research this find out about this and I went sure yeah great and long story short no no theater companies that I could find anyway in Sydney um and maybe I could be wrong, but maybe Australia wide have a, like a dedicated accessibility manager. Um, I know Sydney Fringe have an accessibility coordinator. I know the Opera House have an access coordinator, but um, that's that's pretty much it. Like no nowhere else had it. So that was outrageous to me. Um, and I thought, well, if I'm working here, I want my needs to be met, but I also want to make sure we're including audiences appropriately. And as a as a playwright, I want to make sure that our artists are being included and our creatives are being included. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of a long-winded <laughs> answer to your question. You mentioned... Um people with disability who are playwrights, people with disability who are actors and part of the performance arts community. Do you want to talk about what disability and the arts, well, at least in performing arts and um, writing, what that currently looks like? Yeah. Um, it's it's really interesting because that it seems to be, uh, I think there's still quite a quite a bit of fear around non-disabled creatives including disabled artists in their in their productions I think there's a bit of or quite a bit of apprehension around oh is it is it going to be too difficult what is this going to look like and so then we that's when like nothing nothing happens and those people don't get included um but I also think there's a really really big push from particularly from disabled and and neurodiverse actors and performers specifically, a push to see accurate representation in the casting process, which I think is really, really important. Um, I, I don't know if you've heard or if this is mostly in the sort of performing like circles or if you've heard of the phrase cripping up yes so the term cripping up has um been used in used by actors and performers when a non-disabled actor plays disability so they they play the role of a disabled person in and usually in a way that's like pretty uncomfortable i would say to watch um and and I know there's this artic- this argument from non-disabled actors saying, oh, but, you know, I'm an actor and it's you're trying to fill the shoes of, you know, somebody who's different to you and you're trying to, you know, really just play anybody. Anybody can play any part. But I think it... I feel like it's it, it feels very different when it's you're performing somebody's disability. Um, I think... You know, a classic example that comes to mind is um, Jake Gyllenhaal in that movie Stronger, where I don't know if you've seen that, Susan. No, I he, haven't. He plays he plays a um, a marathon runner, and it's based on a true story, and they they always are. 
Um, you can't get the inspiration unless it's based on a true story. A true story. <laughs> well, and that's this movie 